Welcome everyone to our final session of the second season of uh, Learning with CAETSAS, our TRC 57 speaker series. This is part of Nanaimo Ladysmith Public Schools efforts to learn how to walk differently on the Coast Salish territory, Tsemenis, Snanawas and Snanaimo on the territories that the district works. Uh, my name is Ted Cadwalder. I'm your co-host with my two great friends, Tsongkwaten and Suisa Tatanat, uh, Stephanie Johnson and Lawrence Mitchell. Uh, as always, we want to uh, uh, start our ways here in uh, Coast Salish traditional methods. So I'm going to turn it over to our, our relative Tsongkwaten. the CM Pam Palmeter. Me stoch to eich squalowen, slachen to elitna swalakwa, e quam quam stoch to squalowen, tst, a ton of quail. Tiwit and say, slatha can stoch to themotsiais, hi tabka. Seedsit, CM Heichka Heichka at a high all eight squail, the ton of quail Heichka at a soft tamach. Tihum tate a wetaught, Ellie in a swallaqua. Tihum almost out a eight squallowin. Tihum latlamath a tape at a Salelach e Schwat Willi e Smanamst. Deviat and Kuswa Kikalismus Dimoch. Tihuam Slachen Tanat Huamoch. Deviat and Kuswa Kaki Mus Dimoch. E Mus Dimoch. Tihuam Slachakan Stoch. Tanat Huamoch. Slatha can stoch the muck sweat, the new at the cocky out. Heichka to quotst hua e a ton of tamach, the ton of quail, e to muck squail. Now a squam comes to not to lead it, CM Heichka Heichka. Oh, 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 oh,
Uh, it's, uh, as always, my brother, you may hear the dog barking in the background sometimes at my place, and maybe it's Stephanie's place sometimes too on this session, but that's part of the being online. Um, I want to thank UBC Press uh, for connecting us with our guests, and uh, please see our TRC 57 speaker series website or UBC's Press's website if you'd like to purchase any of the books that we feature on our programs and with a discount as well. Um, I will, am very pleased to be able to host as our last guest of this season, uh, Dr. Pam Palmiter. She's a, a Mi'kmaq warrior, a lawyer, professor, author, social justice advocate, uh, and from Eel River, Bar First Nation in New Brunswick, Chair of Indigenous Governance at Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, Dr. Pam, we're so pleased to be able to host you today. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for opening this in a really good way because I'm very cognizant of the fact that this topic is emotional and it can be triggering and it is very controversial at times. Kwe Nim Deluizi Pam Palmiter. I'm from the sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation and unceded Mi'kma'ki, and my home community is Ugbaganjig, which is Eel River Bar First Nation. But today um, I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg Nation the people of the three fires known as the Ojibwe, Odawa and Potawatomi nations. And so the two local first nations here are the Chippewas of Saguin and Chippewas of Nawash. They're together known as Saguin Ojibwe nations and they're the true governors and protectors of this land. So I'm, I'm very honored to be doing this on their territory. And thank you to everyone involved in putting together this series of lectures to really help lift up Indigenous voices, but also to re-educate Canadians on Indigenous issues, as they have been so miseducated, misinformed when they are informed. Um, I've been a lawyer for 23 years, and I'm going to confess, I did 10 years hard time uh, at Justice Canada, and uh, at Justice Canada and Indian Affairs. And a lot of these issues around identity in the Indian Act obviously were the root of Indian Affairs. I've been a human rights lawyer and I'm a professor, but I did my doctorate on uh, Indigenous identity and belonging. So this relationship between individuals who claim to be Indigenous and the communities or nations that they come from. And, you know, back then, I had no idea just how bad um, pretendians would become to be an issue because you heard one once in a while, but I just had no idea. So my doctorate was really focusing on things like you know, using blood as identity is really problematic, you know, because it doesn't speak to our culture, our language, our traditions, our histories, our kinship, our family relationships, our connection to our land. And now I think that way a thousand times more because pretendians are A, don't have any of our cultural background or B, trying to use a concept, this racist concept of having like one drop of blood from 14 generations ago, and then somehow that, that entitles them to claim to be indigenous. So this like racial characterization created by colonial governments, obviously, um, has continued into present day. And it's, and it's something that, well, if you've watched the media, you know that it's, it's, it's everywhere. And I certainly don't claim to speak for all First Nations or Native Americans because we all have diverse experiences and ideas. And I know this topic is controversial and sensitive and it can also be triggering for the many of us who have suffered directly from colonial laws that have attacked our identities. 
uh, part of which is being connected to our communities, our kinship relationships, and Canada has worked very hard to sever that. So colonial policies have focused almost entirely on forcibly assimilating us and destroying our relationship with our collectives, our relatives, our families, local communities, but also our nations. And we know why it was to acquire our lands and resources to, you know, facilitate settlement. So they've never stopped attacking us though. And, and so it makes it all the more traumatizing for many people when non-native people literally steal our identities for their own purposes. And so I want to share my thoughts with you today about the issue of identity theft and that's with the deepest respect for those with differing views. First of all, there's no such thing as an Indigenous identity. That's just a pan-Aboriginal concept that doesn't actually speak to culture or place or land. I'm from the Mi'kmaq Nation. I have a Mi'kmaq identity. I'm Ilnu. That, that's my identity, just like the Wet'suwet'en peoples have their own identity and, you know, the Cree and, and everyone else. There's no Indigenous identity, like in a pan-Indigenous concept. So that's the first point. The second point is we wouldn't even be having this conversation today were it not for the hundreds of years of genocidal laws, policies, and practices all throughout Turtle Island, what we now know as Canada and the United States, where First Nations in Canada and Native American tribes in the US have fought for generations to try to protect our identities and to protect those kinship relationships in the face of brutal attacks over many generations. Real Native people have suffered hundreds of years of violent colonization, dispossession and oppression because of who we are because of our identities and relationships to our nations who are the true governors of all of our territories. Real native people are impacted. They are angry, frustrated, sad. They are wounded warriors still fighting to protect our cultures and our identities despite all of the other overwhelming issues that stand before us. So the last thing we need our non-native people rolling in and stealing our identity. Think about it, stealing the lands, stealing the resources, stealing our, um, all, all of our rights, stealing our, our bodies. When you think about all of the violence that's been done to indigenous women and girls, and then that moves on to stealing our culture and stealing our art for their own purposes. So think of cultural appropriation and the appropriation of art or actually physically stealing it and putting it in a museum or a church, for example. And now you've got, you know, stealing our identities. Now, some people don't wanna talk about this at all. Some people want us to soften the message or minimize the devastating impacts that it has when people steal our identities. Some have even criticized Native people who have spoken out, who are frustrated, angry, or sad, and, and want to address this issue. They don't want us to use words like pretendian, wannabe, fatey, fake, or fraud. They say that when we use those words, it's divisive and it's hurting our people. But with all due respect, they are entirely wrong. We're not talking about our people. We're not calling out our people. We're not engaged in lateral violence against our people. It can't be lateral if they're non-native people. What we are talking about and what we're calling out are non-native people who steal indigenous identities, cultures, experiences, and stories for their own purposes. And it doesn't matter whether it's because of personal interest, whether it's for social purposes, whether it's for political influence, a job application, access to native specific programs and funding, awards, or to occupy places and spaces that are specifically designated for native people. In the end, it doesn't really matter what their reason is. 
identity theft hurts us as individuals, our families, our communities, and our nations. And who is anyone to tell our people how to feel about the theft of our identities when we can't even freely enjoy our identities without being criminalized? You know, we can't, we can't freely enjoy our identities without experiencing systemic racism and violence. So who is anyone to tell us how we should respond? Who are they to tell us to calm down and use more socially acceptable words that we should suppress our feelings and not risk upsetting non-Native people by calling them out? Well, that would do a disservice to our own nations. Our own nations are impacted. None of us want this theft. Non-Native peoples are literally occupying our places and spaces, usurping our voices, effectively erasing us, like they have throughout history, like they have in books, like they have in politics, like they have everywhere else. And it is this combination of racism and white entitlement to take what they want and erase Indigenous peoples that I think is the reason why it is continuing to increase. I mean, imagine seeing non-Native people using our stories and lived experiences as their own. They have not gone through any of the beauty and wonder of our culture and kinship, nor have they gone through any of the trauma and violence that is ongoing genocide. I mean, people have been saying they lived through residential schools when they didn't. I mean, imagine claiming that atrocity as your own. What a horrible offense to Native people. And then imagine the humiliation and embarrassment we feel when we go to some conference or we go to a workshop and there's a pretendian engaged as an elder or a teacher or a professor, public speaker, or media commentator, and they're talking about a jumbled mishmash of indigenous stereotypes that they got off of Wikipedia. So not only are they miseducating, but they, they hurt us when they do that. They talk about things that they don't know anything about. And you're darn right we have a right to be angry because no one gets to tell any of us how we want to seek justice. Governments targeted our identities and our connections, our kinship, our relationships to our collectives. Think about residential schools. They literally stole our children. Those children were forced into those schools and in boarding schools in the United States too, where they experienced not just physical and sexual abuse, but punishment for speaking their language or engaging in any of our ceremonies. They tried and did disconnect us from our relations, our families and our nations, which is a core part of who we are as Mi'kmaq or Wulistikwe, for example. Those schools also taught us that being native was heathen, pagan, bad, primitive, backwards, and tried to make us ashamed of our identities as, you know, a Haudenosaunee or Cree or otherwise. All of that was reinforced by the Indian Act, who not only banned our ceremonies, but they created this fictional race of Indians that was specifically meant to be detached from our cultures and identities for the purpose of legislating us out of existence. They created a legal fiction, something known as a disappearing Indian formula. So it's like a notional form of blood quantum. It's not real blood quantum because as we all know, science disproved that a long time ago. You don't get 50% of your blood from your mom and 50% of your blood from your dad. That's uh, pseudoscience, long debunked. But they created a notional form, like a fiction, to ensure that we would be eventually uh, assimilated or uh, rendered extinct through legislation. And that's what I wrote my book on, you know, the legislative extinction of Indians. It is guaranteed through the Indian Act, and the federal government still defends their ability to do that. So colonizers created race, we certainly do it, and they made race based on this fictional notion of blood. 
And they ignored our cultural and political identities in exchange for this racist idea based on some kind of blood purity. The other thing about the Indian Act is that they legislated our identity as an individual concept. So you can be an Indian separate and apart from your community, separate and apart from your nation. Um, and it was regardless of whether you had any ties, uh, but they could also remove that identity from you with the flip of a switch. Think about what they did to Indian women, First Nation women and their children. Took their status away by the tens of thousands. But they didn't just remove those Native women and children from their communities. You know, so think about them removing them and having less First Nations people. But they replaced them with white women and white children. So when white women married, non, uh, married Native men, they gained Indian status. So literally, this, there's a long history of white people be, becoming Indians. Um, and so the law did this for a very, very long time. The purpose of that was to not only get rid of Native women because they pass on the culture, they care for children, they pass down the language, but replace them with white women that would present European culture, European language, and be detached from the culture. So this phenomenon of identity appropriation is not new. It started with government laws, but it's been picked up by settlers ever since. But think about all of the other laws and policies that directly attacked our identity. The 60s scoop stole thousands of children and put them into white homes. Now, not all of them, but a good number were bought, sold, and traded. They were abused in those homes, and they were taught their culture was bad, or they weren't taught their culture at all. So it's a direct attack on our identity. Think about the foster care crisis, which continues today, where we have more kids in foster care than during the height of residential schools, primarily going to white homes, primarily not learning their um, language and culture and their own identities, no real celebration of that. So this erasure of indigenous identity goes hand in hand with the appropriation of our identity by mostly white people. Now also think about how our identities have been criminalized. Think about how they've regulated and outlawed hunting, fishing, gathering, our traditional economies like the growth or trade of tobacco. Even our work defending our lands and waters is considered criminal and worthy of surveillance by the state. So we're still portrayed as dangerous people. And so this are, these attacks on our identity have divided us. We have been divided into on reserve, off reserve, 6-1 status, 6-2 status, um, you know, traditional, non-traditional, like all of these colonial concepts have divided us. And we are working really, really, really hard to undo all of that colonized thinking, all of that racism, because I mean, after 500 years, depending on where you live in what's now known as Canada, um, much of that has been internalized, right? I mean, that's what you're taught, that's what you're told. You're only a real Mi'kmaq if you have your status Indian card, you're a band member, all of that stuff. So we have people working really, really, really hard to reconnect to their families, their communities and their nations. We also have nations working really, really, really hard trying to reclaim their citizens, trying to bring these foster care children home, trying to bring people who are adopted out back home. So you've got the collective and you've got these individuals working really hard to restore those kinship relations. And, and that is the key of our identity. It's our relationship, our relationship to our nation, our relationship to the land, our relationship you know, to the spirit world, our relationship to one another. It's all about relationships. And this is important work and it's hard work and it can be traumatizing work. It can be triggering work. Think about all of the old wounds that people have from being disconnected from their families and their communities. So, and I would argue that 
the people that these fake pretendians hurt the most are reconnecting native people because then they get all get painted with the same brush and, and that does a real disservice to them so reconnecting native people from foster care prison you know you name it uh 60s scoop are now competing with the thousands of fakes and frauds out there who are acting like they know more about being native than these people who are reconnecting. They're now at the point of thousands, primarily white people, a large number of French, disproportionately a large number of French people in both Canada and the United States. Prime, the worst part is like in the East. So like Ontario East and the same with like um, the Eastern part, Northeastern part of the United States. So they're claiming false identity for a wide variety of reasons. You have those people who heard family lore about a distant native ancestor, their auntie had high cheekbones, or that they are descended from a Cherokee princess, or the, the worst in my territory is a Mi'kmaq chief. I mean, literally everyone I meet is somehow descended from this one Mi'kmaq chief. And they feel entitled to lay claim to our identities. So you have people who are effectively white ethnic shoppers. They don't want to be a part of their own cultures anymore for whatever reason. They don't want to be held accountable for the historic and ongoing atrocities committed against Indigenous peoples. So the quickest way out of that is to just be one. And so they're searching for this identity. And some people pay thousands and thousands of dollars to genealogists to try to find a native ancestor anywhere. They don't care where it's from. They don't care who it is. And in some cases, they don't even care if they are in fact native or if they even have a name. They just are desperate to hold on to that and say, we get to claim this identity. They assume by virtue of their white entitlement that they are entitled to take whatever culture they want. So you have opportunists and frauds as well who want to exploit native identity and get a leg up on jobs or get scholarships or research funding or get awards or notoriety in the native art community or you know some kind of fame as a media commentator. You also have a large number come to find out from Daryl LaRue's research that they are part of former white power groups, white hate groups, who use a false claim of Métis identity to form groups that are actually, their whole purpose is to oppose Native rights. So, I mean, imagine, I could never have conceived when I was doing my doctorate of A, the large number of, of, of pretendians, but that they would be connected to these white hate groups who would use it strategically to counter native rights. And they do it under the guise of, well, no one can question anyone's identity. That would be colonial and racist and lateral violence. And you don't get to ask me any questions. And they've been able to insulate themselves. Now think about the large number of white hate groups that were in the freedom protests in Ottawa. Remember those trucker protests? They were ridiculing and making fun of native culture. They were wearing native regalia. They were pounding the drums, you know, they were th singing things like yabba dabba do and drinking beer. I mean, literally, on the one hand saying, oh, this native, this trucker protest is supported by natives, while at the same time, just literally belittling and degrading native people, and, and they weren't a part of any community. So sometimes these frauds, they do this as individuals. So they randomly start identifying as native a lot of the time in academia, so in universities, but also in governments and politicians. Other times, these people join groups of other people like them, um, like these white hate groups that turn into, you know, Métis of the Rising Sun or whatever, like there's literally hundreds of them, you know, Acadian Métis, a Canadian Mi'kmaq Métis, a Canadian Woodlands Mi'kmaq Métis. I mean, you name it, there's like a hundred names for them. And these are all new groups 
You know, they haven't been there for hundreds of years. Um, and, they're, and they're all, they just incorporate like a provincial or federal corporation and, and claim to be a native group. And the worst example is the Acadian, the so-called Acadian Métis. Because in our territory in the Maritimes, things were pretty simple. Um, when there was intermarriages, people either lived with non-native people or they lived in the Mi'kmaq or Willistaquay communities. There was no separate community with a separate language and separate culture that developed in the Maritimes. Like think about the Métis Nation, right? The Red River Métis, where they had their own politics, you know, their own rebellions, their own culture. They even had their own language, Machif. None of that was in the Maritimes. Now you'll be able to find people here and there who will say, oh yeah, yeah, because they support this concept of inclusion. Uh, but you will find, you won't find any First Nations or any real experts that have studied this and researched this that will say anything other than there were no Métis in the East. But that doesn't stop them from claiming it. If you dare challenge them, they will scream racism, they'll call you a colonizer, that you're genociding them, and they file complaints and sue and try to make you lose your job and things like that. They've infiltrated universities, governments, courts, police officers, and politicians. It's so bad in the East, like in the maritime provinces, that the Mi'kmaq, and the Métis Nation actually had to sign an MOU saying that Mi'kmaq are the only native group in Mi'kmaq territory. The Métis Nation are the ones who decide who's part of the Métis Nation and that we're gonna work together to call out these frauds and protect our people because um, some of them are challenging Mi'kmaq rights. Some of them say horrible things about Mi'kmaq people. Uh, and this is a real problem. But regardless of whatever group the frauds fall into, they are all part of this white cultural appropriation, identity theft. And in some cases, I think you could make cases for outright fraud. There are cases, and again, through Daryl LaRue's work, um, Distorted Descent, he did a whole bunch of research on these groups. He did a whole bunch of uh, court cases, went through affidavits, online forums. And some of these people don't have any native ancestry at all. They just randomly took an ancestor from the 1600s who was born overseas and changed that person's name to an indigenous name. So to me, that falls under the category of outright fraud. And only a person with that kind of entitled colonial mindset, which comes with this grand sense of entitlement and lack of accountability, would ever think to appropriate native identity. And when I say lack of accountability, there's always red flags, you know, it's, and they pretty much just call themselves out because you'll ask, oh, so where are you from? And, and they don't know where they're from, or they don't say where they're from, or every time they introduce themselves, they're miraculously from six different communities, or they keep changing their words. And so, that's the kind of lack of accountability that we're talking about. And they don't want to be held to account. They don't want to have to explain where they are, where in most Native traditions, I mean, I've been to lots of First Nations in Canada and lots of Native American tribes in the States. The first thing that happens when I go to any Native community, the first thing is some version of who, who's your parents? Whose kid are you? Like, who's your granny? What's your, what community are you from? And no one's saying that as a bad thing, but that's what actual native people do. I mean, sometimes they ask, when are you leaving? But they also ask these questions all around, like, who are you? So that it's, oh, you're Bert and Bertha's kid. Oh, I, okay, I know who you are now because they lived over here and they hunt and trapped with my grandparents. And okay, so I know you because you can't possibly know all of your members. So that's something that happens all the time. So the first red flag for a pretendian is they don't want to answer that or they get offended or they accuse you of lateral violence. And it's like, dude, just asking you who your parents were. They don't want to answer those questions. So this hurts real Native people who are trying to reconnect. 
like I said, after generations of colonial policies. And there's a Native American scholar, her name's Kim Tallbear, and she reminds all of us that these colonial attacks on our identity all throughout history has been focused almost entirely on severing our relations, severing our relationships from our families, communities, and nations, and also our lands, and our spirituality, and the, the earth, and the ecosystem. It's really about isolating us. You know, you think of like an abusive husband, for example, and how they isolate the woman from all of their relationships. Well, that's exactly what was happening. And so the people who are trying to make this reconnection journey or our nations who are trying to bring these people back home or in effect the rest of us who are the walking wounded who like we can never be native enough for Canada we all struggle in some way to reconnect to all of this to our spirits to our history to the land and there's literally thousands of pretendians out there making that journey harder for all of us think about this the, the, the long history of non-status Indians, you know, so the kids of Native women who married out, who lost their status, and then these kids are not registered under the Indian Act, and they had to fight for decades to be recognized again. They're all lumped in, and, and you know, communities are concerned about who are these people? Are you one of these pretendians? Are you a real person? So we know many of these public profiles. In the US, you have people like Grey Owl. I mean, this guy was famous, but he was a British man named Archibald Blaney. He claimed to be native, he was in the media, he was in movies, he was like this international traveler, environmentalist. He played the stoic Indian part perfectly and no one questioned it, no one challenged it until he passed away and his wife was like, yeah, the guy's not even native. But there's other people so in the United States, Native Americans have called out people like Andrea Smith, who is an academic of European descent, who claimed to be Cherokee, but the Cherokee didn't claim her. That's a problem. I don't know. Is she indigenous from some other Native American tribe? Who knows? But the claims she made weren't substantiated by your kin. Joseph Boyden, he was a Scottish and Irish writer who claimed to be Mi'kmaq, my, from my territory, Nipmuc, Ojibwe, and Métis. He got called out because people were like, wait, he's not a part of our Mi'kmaq communities. The Nipmuc said he's not a part of us. No Ojibwe community said he was a band member. And Métis, what are you talking about? He's not part of the Métis nation. So is he Indigenous? Is he some other kind of Indigenous? But he was occupying places and spaces meant for Indigenous peoples. He was the go-to person on the media, on commentary. He was selling books based on this. Come to find out, his whole family knew that they weren't Native. His, like his own relatives were dressing up as fake Natives so that they could sell crafts. You know, I think the guy was named Injun Joe. His own family is saying, oh yeah, we're not Native. You, you know, you've got the same scenario with Michelle Latimer. Is she native? I don't know. I don't know her, but she's a French Canadian actress who claimed to be Algonquin, Métis, and claimed to be from Gitigan Zibi First Nation. Red flag goes up when you claim to be from too many places. What happened? Gitigan Zibi said, wait a second, you're not a member of our community and you don't descend from our community. So it's not so much that we are calling out the pretendians. The pretendians end up calling out themselves with all of these red flags by, and the things they say. I mean, the first red flags for Joseph Boyden were the things he was saying in the media. And we were like, what? The, no native person would be saying things like that. And nobody wanted to talk about whose kid they were. And that's our number one question. So then you have this issue of all of these publicly rejected claims, and then the people they impacted. Because keep in mind, this isn't just about calling out a few individuals. When Michelle Latimer is called out as, as not belonging to any of the communities she says she is, how, that hurts other people. First of all, it hurts all of those communities that she claimed to be with, and then anyone she worked with. 
you know, who maybe lost their job, who couldn't go on to do new shows or like all of these people so horribly impacted by these false claims. And I mean, universities, it's, it's astounding just how bad it is. And it's just, I haven't gone to a university yet that hasn't suffered from pretendians, both in faculty administration and students. And in fact, I've talked to some um, student resource people who actually encourage non-native people to just do the box checking. And so that's opportunistic, it's manipulative, it's exploitative, and it's extractive. They commit literally the same acts of dispossession, appropriation, and violence founded in racism and white entitlement that is the core of white privilege. And it doesn't matter what you call it, pretendian, wannabe, fatey, playing Indian, race shifting, hopeful ethnic shopping, or new age mysticism. Oh my gosh, the new age mysticism I think is the worst. Uh, it's all indigenous identity fraud and it does significant harm. I mean, look at the situation of Carrie Borasa. Is she indigenous? I don't know, I don't know her. She, her family claims that she comes from Europe, that she's not indigenous at all. And now they're, you know, they've done that investigation. Who, who on earth thought that that couldn't be exposed? In, in all of her speeches and commentary, she claimed to be Métis. She claimed to have Métis community acceptance. She claimed to be Anishinaabeg, and she claimed to be Klingit. And then she claimed to have generic Indigenous ancestry and a generic Indigenous upbringing, which of course she stereotyped as violence and sexual abuse and addictions. I mean, come on, at least be original instead of using racist stereotypes about our people to try to make your claims. We know now from her family, none of that happened. But she's not just claiming that. When she claims that identity, she claims the territory. She claims the treaties, the Treaty 4 territory. She claimed a spirit name. I mean, one of the important parts of some of our cultures, not all of them. She claimed our traditions around culture, traditional adoption. So it's not just the identity, it's all of the things that go around our culture that they claim. And now we have Queen's University, of course, where this genealogical report showed what native people have been telling Queen's for years. You've got a large number of pretendians here. They don't know what they're talking about. They're frauds. They don't belong to the communities they say they are. And what was Queen's first response? To instantly defend the pretendians and criticize the native people who were calling this out. I mean, why wouldn't you just look into it and say, these are very you know, very con big concerns, we're, we're going to look into it. Now, of course, they're in that process. But universities who react that way are being defensive. And this really is not about Native well-being. This is about defending their reputation, defending their funding, defending how they look, defending their record on reconciliation, when what they should really be doing is saying, oh, gosh, have we caused great harm to Native communities? Have we caused great harm to native students. And so there's, there's general harms that pretendians do. They will have fake native cards, like status cards that they try to use it as tax exemption cards at businesses. And now there's some businesses that won't even accept our native cards because of all of the fake people trying to um, pawn off fraudulent cards. They, Many of them speak in the media about how bad we are as Native people, but yet they talk so much about caring only about money and benefits. And then there's very specific harms. So those are general specific harms. Like think about all everything that the Mi'kmaq have to go through. The Mi'kmaq in Canada are like the Cherokee in the United States where everyone is claiming to be Mi'kmaq or everyone's claiming to be Cherokee. How does that make us look in the general public or to other First Nations? You, you go to somewhere and you say you're Mi'kmaq and they're like, mm. or you say you're Cherokee and it's like, mm, everyone says that. 
So you're hurting the nation as a whole. And of course, I don't even know how the Métis nation deals with it because everybody's claiming to be Métis. Um, and what they're really saying though in doing that is that everyone is entitled to claim to be indigenous. And so they too are entitled to our native lands and resources. It's effectively erasing us and our rights. Some of the groups, like I said, uh, directly oppose land claims, treaty rights and agreements. Um, First Nations will say no to things like nuclear storage or garbage, toxic garbage dumps on their First Nations. But the fake Métis organizations will not only take consultation money from these energy groups, but they'll say, yes, we're okay with it. So then it, that gives the, all the power to these corporations to say, oh, well, there's no agreement here. You know, First Nations here are saying no, but we've got this Métis group over here. So, you know, we're going to go into business with them and build this toxic uh, waste dump. So they're countering us at every stage. And it hurts us on a much bigger scale. Think about the misuse of cultural practices. Can you imagine not just miseducating Canadians, but miseducating reconnecting Native people or children or people trying to get into, you know, the specific traditional parts of their culture? You've got all of these pretendians miseducating with this pan-Indigenous mishmash of stereotypes. Often it sounds very new agey. They try to play this racist stereotype part and it gets recirculated in society, it spreads. And those who are truly trying to connect don't know what's real and what isn't. And to me, that, that, is, that is one of the worst things that comes out of this. Someone who was adopted out from the 60s scoop is trying to reconnect and learn their traditions. And you've got a bunch of fakes walking around saying, Oh, we build dream catchers and my spirit name is X, Y, and Z. And it's just none of these things have anything to do with that particular culture. So they're left with nothing better than, you know, Googling stuff on the internet. But the, the other part about this is they often make money off of these stereotypes, whether it's in the art world, online business, cultural appropriation is huge, especially in this new age sector. And they always use these same stereotypes, just like Barasa did, that they're poor, they have a dysfunctional family, they're abused, you know, they're alcoholics. Imagine how all of our families feel watching and listening to all of these white people claim and steal their stories. I mean, those are stories we wish we didn't have. We, none of us wanted to go to residential school or foster care. None of us wanted to be impacted by over-incarceration, police shootings, murder to missing, none of us. That, so that's not like something we're guarding as, oh, you know, we're, that's so great. But to have someone else so flippantly just claim all of that stuff it, is really hurtful. It also limits us to stereotypes. So that basically teaches society that to be Indigenous is all of just these stereotypes. Um, and it, it, this, I can't imagine. Imagine if Native people went around faking to be a Holocaust survivor. I mean, just saying it is horrendous. Like, you can't imagine anyone ever doing that. But that's what they do to us. That's what they do to us. It's literally unconscionable. And so in terms of, you know, just before I end, in terms of like universities, there, there's a real specific impact because it's so prevalent now and universities don't really know how to grapple with it and don't want to. But here's, here's the harms that they do. They steal teaching positions, research funds, awards, you know, they sit on advisory committees saying what should or shouldn't happen on reconciliation. There's so many of them in some universities uh, that other people, other faculty and students start looking at all native faculty with suspicion. 
are they real? Are they really indigenous? Because this other one was saying, you know, dream cutters are part of every native, you know, culture. And if I'm saying, no, they're not, then I look like the pretendian because maybe I just don't know. So it causes real problems. Um, it, it hurts students. I mean, imagine, imagine students trying to learn whether it's native studies or native history or native culture, native politics, native law in all of these universities. And you think, you know, you picked a specific university or a specific program so that you can learn from actual native people with lived experiences. You go and you get your degree or even worse as a grad student, you get your master's or your doctorate under their supervision. And then you come to find out they were all a fraud that nothing that you learned from them was true. Nothing was authentic. You, you, you go and you look at everything that you wrote in your grad work and you see that, oh no, I cited their materials. I cited their sources. I mean, that even happens to us. Uh, imagine, you know, having to go through your old, you know, your books or anything that you write in an academic journal and say, oh gosh, did I, did I quote this person? It's, it just causes so much havoc. And it's the kind of havoc that can't be undone. What are you going to do? Pay for this native student to have another grad degree? Probably not. It's irreparable harm that universities haven't taken full accountability for. How do you make reparations to those people? And how come they're still letting it happen? So Universities don't want to do this because they're worried about human rights complaints. They're worried about lawsuits. They're worried about public attacks or looking bad. So it pits real Native people against our own universities. We don't want to do that. Like for an issue that doesn't even come from us. It also pits us against individuals in the media. Because if someone is going out there pretending to be something that they're not and it's going to hurt us, we have no choice but to call it out. None of us want to. None of us are like, yay, we get to call out someone else today. Because you get a lot of hate mail, you get threats, you get complaints, you get lawsuits. So this doesn't help us at all. None of us get anything out of calling out a pretendian. But if we don't, who's going to do it? Because we're in privileged positions. Students aren't. You know, people without tenure aren't. And so we have to stand up for those people, even though we don't want to. And it distracts from real important work. Do you think I want to talk about pretendians when I'd much rather be working on, you know, ending murder to missing Indigenous women and girls, uh, decarcerating our people from prison, addressing the water crisis, making sure our human rights are implemented? Like, that's the good work. I want to be nation building. You know, I, I want to be working in my nation and doing all the good stuff and doing all the celebrations. It wastes our time having to do this, but we don't have a choice. And so all of, all of this reminds us to think about the real harm to other people. So much focus gets on the pretendian. Oh, what if their feelings are hurt? Or, you know, what if they lose their job? And no real thought to actual Native people. And so I say, on a go forward basis, we need to institute in universities and in governments and businesses, publishing houses, anywhere, relationships with local First Nations, or if you're in the North with local Inuit land claim communities, or if you're in the Métis Nation area with the local Métis Nation, because it's through those relationships that you will be able to come up with processes to be accountable. So for example, here in Ontario, uh, we were doing things for uh, post-secondary education back when it wasn't the Ford government and the other government was paying for uh, post-secondary education. We had a process where, you know, these, all these First Nation students whose parents made under a certain amount would be able to go to university paid for by the province, which was a fantastic process. But we had to deal with what about all of the people who will fraudulently claim that? So we said, okay, here's all of the different ways and all the different communities that people are from. You can identify them as that. But if there's any doubt, if the person can't provide any proof, 
then you go to the local First Nation or the community they say they are from. So the first response from people would be, well, what if I'm not a band member because of racist discrimination in the Indian Act? That happens all the time. But there was a process for that. You could say, due to sex discrimination in the Indian Act, I'm not registered, but my mom is a member of this band, this First Nation, for example. So there was always a way to work with the local community, our relatives, to establish who is and who isn't, where there was doubt. I mean, in some instances, there's not a lot of doubt because people offer that. Like, I always find it funny when we go to meetings at universities and they're like, okay, let's do an accountability statement. And I say, well, here's who I am. Here's my first nation. Here's a, you know, I, I blot out the personal stuff, you know, here's uh, everything that shows my membership, all of that stuff. The only people who get upset are the ones who don't have community connections. So at the end of the day, I, I'm saying you've got to have an accountability process. You have to work with local First Nations or Inuit or Métis Nation to do this. You have to respect our legal right to decide who our people are. That's a right that's not only protected in Indigenous laws, it's also protected in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We have a right to determine who our citizens are and what their responsibilities are. The world has changed. The federal government enacted UNDRIP. BC enacted UNDRIP. So we really need to be purposeful about that. And as uncomfortable as it is, all of these groups and organizations are going to have to start being accountable. And they can do that. You know, there's lots of resources online. You can read Audra Simpson, Kim Tallbaird, you know, Daryl LaRue, uh, lots of people on issues around fraudulent identities. There's even a website called raceshifting.com. You can literally go on and verify if someone's saying, oh, I'm from, I don't know, Red River, Orange Tree, Métis Nation. You can go on and see if they're a legitimate part of the Métis Nation or if they're one of those fraudulent groups or one of those fake groups. I mean, it's all right there. We're just kind of a little bit nervous to do that. And here's the thing about reconciliation. I've said it a hundred times. If it feels good, it's not reconciliation. Reconciliation and reparations and justice and ending injustice is uncomfortable because it requires accountability. It requires reparations and it requires being brave and exposing what we're not doing right and taking steps to fix it. So, you know, I implore all Canadians, even other native people, don't criticize us when we call out fake people. Don't attack us. We're standing up for all of the people who don't have the ability to stand up or will suffer terrible repercussions if they, they stand up. And we're also standing up for all of those people who are re-traumatized and re-triggered by white people claiming our identities. We should be supported in that and not isolated. So let's go about that hard work of bringing our people back home, restoring our kinship relationships, and not worrying too much about whether we're doing it, what words we're using, and you know, whether or not we're upsetting all of these frauds, because that's, that's beyond the issue. And you know, ultimately, we have legal things that we're going to have to do. So the Mi'kmaq people have to legally defend against you know, the Acadian Métis and all these other fraudulent groups in our territory. It costs us a lot of money a lot of time, a lot of energy that we should be putting towards defending our fishing rights. So your support on those kinds of things are helpful as well. Um, I, I tried to cover it all. I wasn't sure if I had till seven, but um, I'm more than happy to stay as long as you needed that, for anyone that has questions. Uh, Dr. Pam, thank you so much. You, you did a beautiful job. I was just following some of the things on the chat here. Uh, but you did a beautiful job of just uh, centering it on relationships and the importance of those relationships with land, with relatives, with culture and communities. Uh, you put it back to your book too, where this started with the intent of the Indian Act to erase Indigenous mm -hmm. people uh, within two generations specifically. Um, but also uh, you talked about that targeted action and, and ways that we can go back to community to center that again and say, okay, are we doing this okay on this territory? Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a lot of work to do. And uh, one of the chats I saw 
on there said it would be great if non-Indigenous organizations did that work so that it did not fall on the shoulders of our whole Mohawk relatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. I'm going to turn it over to uh, our relative Tsongkhatan to close out our house and if anything final he wants to say as well. Just really, really raising my hands for you carrying out your important work and bringing in, keeping things proper and making things right. I know it's hard work and I'm thankful that there are people like yourself out there carrying it out. Um, making the way for people like my, myself to learn who I am. And the people in the school district, uh, it's a lot to digest. <laughs> my mind is like blown. Cause I didn't know it was like this out there. Um, but I'm really honored and uh, coming from a really heartfelt place that I'm sending you my prayers. Mm -hmm. Everybody in our district is sending you our thoughts and our prayers and really honoring and acknowledging you uh, for everything that you do and everything that you stand for and everything that you fight for. You're a beautiful woman and uh, we are there with you in our heart and in our spirit. Keep up the good, good work. And I, I hope that you can lay this to rest and you can become more yourself and help your people in a, a more powerful and meaningful way. So, I'm going to share a song to close us out.